Our previous lecture surveyed religious and literary aspects of ancient Near Eastern mythology. Today, we will look at the relationship between ancient Near Eastern myths and the Bible. In the 19th century, the educated public in the United States and in Europe was confronted with the publication of documents from the ancient Near East that had only recently been deciphered. You will recall that it was in the early to mid 19th century that the great decipherment work took place of Egyptian, of the cuneiform languages. Within decades, the material was published, people began to read it, and there were very powerful reactions to it. As they read these documents, they found, among other things, accounts of creation, stories of a universal flood, tales of days of judgment when humans would be judged in a kind of final moment in which their fate would be decided. And reading these, they naturally questioned the relationship of this material to the Bible and their own relationship to the Bible. That is, the Bible was the foundational text of Christian life, especially in Protestant Europe, where we have the notion of sola scriptura, advanced by the Reformation leaders. The Bible is the source of authority, not the church. Well, if the Bible is the source of authority, what does it mean that there are now texts that may be older than the Bible or that seem to challenge the Bible in some way? New methods of literary criticism were applied to the Bible, and they suggested that there was influence. Earlier texts had influenced the Bible. Well, was the Bible a text that could be influenced? Wasn't it divine? So what was this speech of influencing. In my lecture, I'll describe various responses to these challenges, both secular and religious, because really what we have here is a crisis of belief, and there were very creative responses to this crisis. They ranged from a complete rejection of the findings. That is, uh, it's not true that there were ancient texts. You're mistaken if you think they're older than the Bible. Two, various strategies of accommodation with findings that proved in the end to be scientific. Now, there were four challenges to authority, to biblical authority and historicity in the mid-19th century. The first, which I alluded to in two earlier lectures, was the challenge from the science, the emerging science of geology. The biblical chronology suggested that the world human habitation on the world was only 6,000 years old, and that the earth itself was created within what for the Bible was historical memory. The Bible begins with an account of creation. Humans knew of creation. Well, here was geology showing that the crust of the earth was, in the first reports, tens of thousands of years old. Of course, now we know it's much older, but imagine you're in 1850 Boston reading this, and you read that the earth is not 6,000 years old, it's 42,000 years old. What does this do to your sense of chronology, which had been conditioned by biblical numbers? Let us pay homage again to Bishop Usher and his claim that the world was created on October 22nd in 4004 BC. So it was only 6,000 or so years old. A second great challenge, the publication of Darwin's On the Origin of the Species in 1859. What did this do? It upset people's acceptance, widespread acceptance of the idea presented in the first chapters in Genesis that the creation of humans was a separate act of creation than the creation of animals. The creation of humans by will. God decides to create humans. Let me remind you of the verse in Genesis. Let us create man in our image. Understood in most of the commentarial traditions to be God speaking in the divine we or God consulting with the angelic hosts. Humans are the crown of creation, according to the biblical account, created through speech. Well, 
human evolution, as posited by Darwin, challenged this and challenged it very powerfully. A third challenge, biblical criticism, a form of literary criticism as applied to the Bible. Literary criticism had previously been applied to the Greek myths, to Homer specifically. Now, some of these same theorists and their students were looking at the Bible in the same way. They posited a documentary hypothesis that the text of the Hebrew Bible, specifically the text of the five books of Moses, on which this theory focused, were really separate documents. There were different numbers in the theories, four or five or six, that had been edited at some final point in the last centuries before the Christian era. So the Bible did not arrive in one package, which is what the common assumption was. Uh, with my undergraduates, I tried to convey this in this way, that uh, for the people in the 19th century, they imagined that the Bible was dropped, revealed in one moment. In our terms, we might think of the Bible as coming in an email attachment. Zap. It's all there. Nothing changed. No one edited it. No one tampered with the file. That's the Bible. And you must accept it. Well, in a sense, the whole notion of evolution, here I'm going back to Darwin, the whole notion of evolution gets into culture. Culture evolves. So a text such as the Bible also evolved. Scholars pointed to the two creation accounts in the book of Genesis. There are two stories in the first two chapters. One tells us that man and woman were created together at one time. The other account tells us that woman is created from Adam's rib. Now, the biblical commentators have a way of explaining this seeming contradiction. But for literary scholars, the answer was simple. There were two documents. They had been joined together or redacted. So we have the challenge of geology, the challenge of evolution, and the challenge of biblical criticism. And finally, and this is the most central to our uh, discussion today, we have the challenge of the ancient Near Eastern texts. For the decipherment of these texts presented the public with stories that challenged their notion of biblical originality. And once you challenge the notion of biblical originality, you also challenge authority. Originality is something that people can overlook, but authority they can't overlook. If one is supposed to conduct one's life according to the Bible, and the Bible is itself a derived text, then why, people ask, should they continue to conduct their lives that way? It may be hard for us in an age of skepticism to understand the power of this challenge. It was overwhelming for 19th century educated people it was very much as if UFOs had landed. The UFOs were these new scientific ideas which showed them that the Bible was not an original document, that the Bible derived from other cultures, and that there had been a full cultural flowering before the Bible. Explorers and archaeologists, among them clergymen, were drawn to the question of ancient Near Eastern texts and to the way that these texts were found. So we have a curious phenomenon of many clergymen who were also at the same time professors. In the 19th century, there was a real combination of the professorship and the clergy, especially in American Protestant institutions. These people were drawn to archaeology. And here we have one of the responses to the crisis. They said, we can become engaged in this science, the science of studying the Bible, and use it to buttress the authority of the Bible. We can show that archaeology might in some ways challenge biblical authority, but other aspects of archaeology can prove the Bible to be true. And here we have something that still operates uh, throughout the United States, seminars and excavations often held in the summer, heavily attended by people who are interested in biblical studies, which the seminars attempt to prove the biblical truth. And they use that phrase, 
by going to sites associated with biblical history. Now, those people, other than clergymen, who were excavating in the Near East, were very quick to understand the appeal of the biblical connection to the ancient Near Eastern texts and to the way which they were found. Uh, I've mentioned a number of times one of my culture heroes, Sir Leonard Woolley, the great British archaeologist, who it does not seem was uh, deeply religious, but who understood that for the public, the connection to the Bible was all important. So when he excavated in the city of Ur in Iraq, he made sure to highlight the connection between Abraham and Ur, although his excavations had nothing to do with Abraham. They were of the royal cemetery of Ur from the third millennium, which long preceded Abraham. These excavators found that believers were willing to countenance the project of archaeology linked to the Bible if they felt that the project could lend some credence to biblical accounts. The greatest challenge from the Near Eastern texts to the idea of biblical originality came from the flood narratives discovered in the 19th century. In a very dramatic 1872 lecture, the British scholar George Adam Smith spoke to a large audience and said that he was going to read them from the text of the Babylonian Noah. That was his phrase. His source was the 11th tablet of the Epic of Gilgamesh, which had been unearthed long before in the excavations of Nineveh near the city of Mosul in Iraq, a city I'm sure you've heard of if you've been listening to the news recently. The tablet tells of Utnapishtim, a hero of this tablet who survived the flood and gained immortality. Let us hear some of this tablet from the 11th tablet of the Epic of Gilgamesh. There was a city called Shurupak on the banks of the Euphrates. It was very old, and so many were the gods within it. They converged in their complex hearts on the idea of creating a great flood. There was Anu, their aging and weak-minded father, the military Enlil, his advisor, Ishtar, the sensation-craving one, and all the rest. Ea, who was present at their council, came to my house, and frightened by the violent winds that filled the air, echoed all that they were planning and had said. In this opening fragment of the tablet, we see that the flood is going to be brought by a congregation of the gods. The gods confer, they argue. And in our series, we've already met some of these gods. We've met Ishtar, also known as Inanna in Sumerian, the goddess of love and war. And we've met Ea, also known as Enki. I called him the administrator god, the organizer god, the god who favors humanity. What is his job in this story? He's coming to people, to one person, and he's going to tell them about the flood. What does he tell them? Men of Shurupak, he said, tear down your house and build a ship. Abandon your possessions and the works that you find beautiful and crave and save your life instead. Into the ship bring the seed of all living creatures. And now we hear the voice of Utnapishtim again. I was overawed, perplexed, and finally downcast. I agreed to do as Ea said, but I protested. What shall I say to the city, the people, the leaders? Tell them, Ea said, you have learned that Enlil, the war god, despises you and will not give you access to the city anymore. Tell them this, for Ea will bring the rains.